Okay, so today I'm going to go over data citation, DOIs and the and services that support data citation. I'm also going to come across the questions that ANS is most often asked about this area, but I'm taking a fairly high level approach. So I'm going to assume that I don't need to convince you of the benefits or the needs for data citation. I'm going to also assume that you know what a DOI is and that you are, or perhaps in the future, access the ANS machine to machine services, particularly for data citation. Now, if those assumptions aren't true, please um, uh, figuratively put your hand up and, and pop something in the question box. Conversely, if what I'm saying, and I am going over some uh, older material as well, so if what I'm saying is painfully obvious to you, please also put your hand up and we can uh, fast forward a bit. Okay, so let's sort of take the 30,000 foot view of the data citation landscape. DataCite is an international non-profit consortium for data citation that has, has come out with a goal of effectively trying to do for data what Crossref has done for publications for some time. Uh, it's built on a very widely deployed and familiar DOI infrastructure. Uh, again, a sort of non-profit international infrastructure uh, usable for you know, a whole, whole bunch of ways. Currently, ANS is the only Australian registration agent for data site, which means we can create DOIs. But this is not exclusive in any way. Anyone else could uh, rock up to data site, pay the membership fee and start meeting DOIs also. Now, ANS provides a service, and you're probably going to hear this term quite a bit today, Site My Data, and I'm going to focus in on that service quite a bit very soon. The other thing we need to start talking about is citation metrics, and I'm particularly going to focus on those three areas of the journal companies, cross-site and some of these domains portals. So this is an area that's in rapid flux and um, uh, you know, is, is, is far from settled. So we're sort of taking a snapshot there and the uh, best I, I can do there is show you what current practice is. So uh, the Site My Data service. So let's suppose uh, you're ready to, and you're convinced of the benefits of data citation, and you're ready to work with ANS to attach a DOI to your data and enter the, the brave new world of data citation. That reference I've got on there is uh, a good place to start. Um, and I, I, I can go into more detail in the, over these six steps that I've got here later in the, in the webinar. For now, I'm going to stick at a fairly high level so you get the big picture. Um, so um, step one, step two, and step three there are effectively administrative steps. Um, you know, with some back and forth with usage agreements uh, and you providing us with some technical details so we can give you access to the service. Uh, step four is effectively your data citation P plates. I know um, many people will ha have um, functional and unit tests on their research data software that they will want to run and you don't want to do that you know, with production DOIs or production services. So we do run a test prefix service. Once you've gone through that and you're, you're successfully through your P plates and haven't been booked, um, it's on to step five, which is another final administrative agreement um, and finally, you've got your open license in step six, and you're ready to start uh, minting full production DOIs with the, with the uh, assurance that um, everything went well on your P plates and your tests are all passing. Now, this is an extremely high level uh, and, and abstracted away most of the details view of what's going on. So, ANS in this case, uh, even though we provide the Site My Data service, is effectively a front end or a proxy for the international data site infrastructure in the blue box there. And we're also doing it in such a way that um, future interactions you have with Research Data Australia take your uh, DIs into account. Uh, it's a simple request and response type machine to machine service only at the moment. 
Um, and once you've got that, then you're expected to maintain that 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 uh, link to that DOI, so you can use it in in future harvests. Now, this is, as I say, this is uh, very high level, and I'm skipping over a lot of the gnarly and sort of error conditions type details. But um, I love to talk about that stuff. So uh, if anybody wants to get in touch or focus in on the more technical side, I'm happy to do that, that directly with you or, or after this webinar. Uh, so one of the things I'm often asked is, is this workflow set in stone or could you go about this in another way? And the short answer is yes. Uh, if you let us know your feedback or your requirements, then we will certainly look at other ways of, of providing uh, access to data citation services. Uh, and a good example might be people who already have significant data collections in RDA uh, might want to retroactively mint DOIs provided the data, the metadata is, um, you know, meets the minimum standard, uh, which I'll talk about later. And there's, we're also looking into, we've had requests for a sort of um, per institution homepage where you can look at your data citation status and <clears throat> how many, you know, how many uh, DOIs you've minted and um, uh, how complete your minting is across RDA. So the sky's really the limit there and it really, ends as always, as always is driven by uh, the needs of the data owners there. So please let us know if you have ideas or suggestions. Okay, there's something slightly different about the end site my data service compared to the other services. Um, so the other services, you know, including Harvest into RDA and RIFCS, which you're maybe used to using or considering using, uh, it, it's usually a relationship, at least initially, directly between ends and yourselves, uh, which and we then provide your metadata to the world. But initially, it, it's a sort of one-to-one -one relationship. We have never imposed extremely strict metadata requirements on those harvests, um, and you know different organisations have different levels of, of metadata, uh, you know that that suits their workflows. And our services we're funded essentially to target the Australian research and government data sectors. The site my data service is slightly different because we're effectively a front end. Uh, to an international DOI and, and data site infrastructure, the DOIs you mint and the transactions you do with our services appear very quickly in that international infrastructure. And once they appear, we can't arbitrarily take them back without a, a formal, um, a formal um, change or redaction process. So it instantly involves the rest of the world. This and data site, so we, we have no choice but to impose the minimum quality and data standards that, that data site uh, impose, and that includes a compulsory set of metadata. That's not particularly onerous from memory. It's five metadata fields uh, that looks a lot like a subset of Dublin Core. Uh, there are optional metadata standard, optional metadata fields as well, which we encourage but don't enforce uh, organisations to complete. Okay, the, I guess the next um, most common thing I'm asked about and services is, is this is all very this is all very good, but what happens when you go away? And the short answer for the DOIs you've minted and their metadata, nothing will happen. So we've taken the approach that when you approach us to mint DOIs, we register your URL, your name directly with data site. And because the international DOI infrastructure is persistent anyway, ANS could disappear tomorrow and your the status, uh, discoverability and availability of your DOIs and citations will be as they are today. Uh, if you want to mint more DOIs and ANS is no longer doing this, you will need to find another registration agent, but I'm confident either a, another Australian or an international one uh, would come along in time. So uh, I, I can also say, and I notice uh, one of the ANS directors, Andrew Trelaw is with us today. I'm sure he'll jump in to reassure you if I'm incorrect, but uh, I believe the federal government has guaranteed to keep the ANS services running, not 
saying where or how, but uh, there is that guarantee. But in particular with DOIs, you, you're going straight into an international infrastructure and that will persist. Okay, the next big thing, so time and now money. Uh, in the past, uh, it has cost uh, a small amount to mint DOIs. Uh, the International DOI Federation has uh, abandoned that model. They have a membership model now. ENS is funded to provide infrastructure to the research and government data sector in this country, and therefore we provide this service for free. Um, the block of DOI address space that we get from data site with our own prefix is effectively infinite. Uh, so they're not going to run out anytime soon. Um, I would say that if you feel you need 3 million of these things in a hurry, you should probably contact us so that we can come up with a, a better bulk workflow. Um, but for you, uh, cost is not an issue. Okay. so. This is a machine-to-machine -machine service and, you know, anything that involves programmers and programming can incredibly actually go wrong. Uh, so a, a couple of ways of if things do go wrong, uh, particularly when you're on your P-plates, uh, please let services at ANS know and everything that goes to that email address is given a ticket and is formally tracked. If you want to talk to one of your friend, friendly neighbourhood ANS client liaison officer, and I notice Andy White is with us today. If you have a uh, sort of broader need to discuss how this work or how you think it could work work better, uh, please contact me directly or again services at ENS and that will make sure it gets to the right person. If you have questions that are, uh, you know, of more of a, a design or usage or high level Thing, or you would benefit from an ANS person sitting down with you and looking at your workflows and your data issues. Again, please talk to a CLO. Uh, Karen, this is group here, has a wide range of options for, for helping you. Uh, or contact me, uh, particularly on the more technical or workflow side of things. Uh, and we're all always happy to uh, hear how people are using the ANS services or would like to use them. On the face of it, um, this is a very simple question and, and uh, we live in a complex world, unfortunately, and the answer to a lot of these questions is it depends. So one of the things we're often asked is, is at what granularity should I cite my data? And I, I normally do that annoying thing of turning around and asking, answering a question with a question and say, well, what, what level of data would your data users expect to see it at you know would they if it's a if it's a biological data set would they expect to see you know one sequence or one gene if it's an astronomy thing would they expect to see a whole chunk of the sky or one light curve uh, if it's a social science thing would they expect to see a, a whole survey with a million respondents or just one postcode there, there, are, there are no sort of universal best practices I can point to on this, but it, it does vary widely from discipline to discipline. Having said that, um, if you have a naturally hierarchical data set, you can consider having DOIs that cite at multiple levels of that data set. So some people may be interested in the data set as a whole and want to cite that as a whole. Uh, some people might want to zoom right in and be interested in very low level elements of that data set. So again, you know, if you know you have those two kinds of data users, I would consider multiple citations to different parts of the data set. The optional, the data site optional metadata is quite rich and, and allows you to build up what's in effect for the data equivalent of the social graph, you know, where you can build linkages um, between within a data set and two other data sets and allow people to use the DOI resolution infrastructure to navigate that, that graph, uh, which I know sounds quite abstract, but I can expand on that uh, if, if, if once I know more about, about uh, people's particular data issues. Now, this is the big one, um, and it, it's so such a deceptively simple question, and I think uh, you know, I've spoken to a number of BAs and data archivists who have struggled very long and hard with this 
issue. What do I do when my data changes? And the reasons for changing are, are as numerous as there are data sets and researchers, I think. And again, I can't uh, give you a universal answer that will fit all situations. So here's three, here's three approaches that may or may not be suitable in your domain. You could consider taking time-based snapshots. So say, for example, you were doing economic statistics, you know, where the date of the data set is significant, uh, then you might have, um, you might have DOIs um, snapped in time. Uh, if you have an instrument, you know, that's taking a photograph of Mount Everest every five minutes, then time is a factor and you might want a different DOI every five minutes. The other thing you can do is instead of going through time with the whole data set, you could uh, do what software people call a delta, where you issue a DOI to only the changed elements of a data set. So if it's a gigantic data set and you've only changed 1% of it, you might issue the 1% as a delta uh, and give that a DOI with these instructions that people need to apply that to the giant data set. This optional metadata I referred to is also good for building up not just uh, hierarchical structures, but structures in time. So uh, a data set can refer to itself or related versions of itself going back in time. Um, and again, people can, can sort of walk that graph. If you uh, let us know specifically what your issues are, we, chances are we can probably point you to someone who's had a similar issue, uh, or we may be able to suggest a, a good way to use the service. Now, We've had, you know, maybe three or 400 years of learning how to do journal and publication citations. And it's very, uh, although even that's changing, but it is very well understood and it's, it's become sort of socialized in the, the research sector. We've only had a few years of doing this with data citations. So it, to say it, it's early days is probably the understatement of the decade. However, um, there are some, uh, emerging developments that are worth looking at um, and I'm going to uh, quickly talk about uh, four of those. The first one are these domain specific data portals and there's two examples there, Pangea, the Earth and Environmental Sciences one and Dryad, the Applied Biosciences one. So these portals are domain specific, usually non-profit, international, uh, and you know each of them hopes to become the, the first point of call for data in a particular domain or or but the subject area. Um, and if they're built around DOIs and citation from the outset, uh, that can make your life a bit easier. And um, particularly, you know, if it's truly open and they're providing you with citation metrics, that might be a way. If you have, if there happens to be one in your uh, in your subject area. These uh, portals, and we're going to see this come up again, are completely blurring what a publication means, and I'll return to that idea in a moment. Um, so we're starting to see new online only journals who are even further blurring what a publication means. Some of them will require that you, or require or insist that you deposit data and software with a publication and all those elements are up for peer review, including uh, you know, rerunning results to see how you've got them. Uh, Giga Science is a new one uh, and actor Chris E is, is a very specific one in crystallography. But Giga Science is an interesting one. They're also assuming uh, that this is for people with very large data sets uh, in the biosciences, but completely blurring what it means to publish something. Very exciting stuff actually. How are other people doing it? Um, oh, actually, excuse me for one moment. Um, I might just quickly also focus on um, the journal companies. Uh, I don't want to say too much about this. Karen has a lot of material and has run other webinars on this. The journal companies are waking up to this, uh, you know, as a business opportunity uh, since they're already doing it for publications. And there is uh, a collaboration between DataCite and Crossref called CrossSite, where the journal companies are going to try and track both data and publication citations. So that 
there, there may be other initiatives out there I'm not aware of, and please let us know if you know of any that that that's probably a good start for you know how to get how to get going in this world of data citation. Uh, here's three upcoming uh, webinars uh, that Karen's group here will be running. Um, Heather Pivova there is, is probably one of the top people in the world on impact of data sharing and everything she writes on her blog uh, is, is worth reading. In fact, everyone there, we, we've been very, we've been, um, what, well, Karen has been very astute in picking very good people for this uh, from all over the world. So, I, I, as my lecturers used to say to me, I commend those to you. Okay, so I've zoomed through that. Here's a few references for what we've just been uh, talking about, including that last one is uh, for any developers uh, who want to access the data site metadata service directly. There's a schema there. Uh, now. I'm happy to take questions. Um, I can also go into more detail about the six steps of accessing the service if that's helpful. Uh, otherwise, we'll uh, throw it open to questions, I think. <laughs> 